Welcome, welcome to this week's Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a guest that we've loved before and we're glad to see back again today with an update on a topic that's crucial for higher education. We've been tracking enrollment in higher education since we began. After all, enrollment is crucial to how higher education works. It's a way of think. it's our main way of, of functioning as teachers, of course, and it's also financially our main revenue stream. So how has that been changing? What do we know about how many students are enrolled? How has that been changing since the pandemic or since the pandemic has begun to die down? I'm absolutely excited to welcome Doug Shapiro. He's the head of the National Student Research Clearinghouse Research Enterprise, and he does fantastic work. This is where I go every semester to learn about enrollment numbers and enrollment data. Doug has a mind like a steel trap, and he knows everything about his data and is willing to analyze it for us. Um, without any further ado, let me just welcome uh, my good colleague and our wonderful researcher, Doug Shapiro. Hello, Doug. Hello, Brian. How are you? It's good to see you again. Oh, it's great to see you, pal. It's really good to see you. Where have we found you today? Are you at home? I am at home here in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> good to see you. Um, you know, Doug, we, we ask people to introduce themselves in a particular way to ask what they're working on for the next year. And I'm, I'm just curious, what, what are you going to be working on for the rest of 2023? What are the big projects and what are the big topics that are going to be top of mind for you? Well, our, you know, our focus has has hardly changed in the last three years. We've been we've been laser focused on trying to get the 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 most uh, timely information on enrollments and uh, and what's happening in uh, to students and institutions during the during the pandemic. And um, that's not changing. We're, we're still focused on that over the next year. Um, we do have some some uh, uh, some new some new interesting projects. Like so, one of these is where we're now a part of the the um, uh, the arc. Um, uh, what is it? The uh, <laughs> this is a research uh, set, a, a team of researchers, six teams of researchers, actually, uh, research projects uh, uh, focused on accelerating recovery in community colleges across the country. Mm. So they're, they're um, really, really trying to figure out not only um, where is the recovery taking place, uh, but also what can we learn from where it is and isn't to help more community colleges uh, uh, join that join that recovery and figure out how to how to bring students back and to serve their communities better, and so we're really excited about that. In fact, the the latest enrollment report that we just released was um, uh, was was enhanced in many ways. We added a lot of additional details specifically to help focus on the the folks from community colleges um to to inform them more about 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 exactly this topic thanks thanks in in large part to some of the funding from this uh from this project which came from the institute for educational sciences we're very excited oh. about that too oh excellent excellent I mean, community college enrollment has been clobbered for years um I, I, it would be great to be able to turn that around absolutely well, uh, as always, we're just uh, I'm speaking on behalf of everybody in higher education. We are just delighted by your by your research, which is so timely and uh, it feeds into personally my research and my teaching. And uh, I'm just I'm so excited by this. Friends, if, if you're new to the forum, I'm just going to ask Doug a couple of questions to get the ball rolling. But then I'm going to yield the podium over to you. So please think about the questions you'd like to ask. Um, and uh, I'll let you know when you can start doing that in just a minute. So my, my first question to ask, Doug, is people have spoken of your fall 2022 data as showing a recovery from the pandemic enrollment declines. Is that accurate? Uh, no. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was very much a good news, bad news kind of report. And, um, you know, the bad news was that the number of undergraduates uh, 
in the U.S. is still falling. So we really haven't started to recover yet at all by that that one simple fact. But but the good news is that um, you know they're they're falling at a much slower rate than they have been in the two previous years. So we only lost about a half a percent this year. And um, you know when 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 you've been in free fall essentially for two years, that kind of stabilization is a good thing. Um, but it really is more of a move toward a stabilization. We're, we're, we're arresting the decline, but I, I wouldn't call it yet a recovery. So half a percentage point. Um, and and that that's good news, um, but still we're, we're, we're dropping and uh, we've, we've lost a lot of students since 2012. Right, absolutely. And, and, you know, the other, I guess the other reason that some people want to call this a recovery is because if you focus on the freshman class, the incoming freshmen, so what I've been, what I just talked about was total numbers of undergraduates who are currently in, in, in school. Um, there has been what looks like a, some signs of what looks like a recovery there. Um, um, we, we saw about a 4% uh, increase in the number of freshmen this year across all colleges, community colleges and four-year colleges, et cetera. Um, about 4% higher than the number that we had last year in, uh, in 2021. And that includes a, a, even a, a larger jump at community colleges, which had been the hardest hit, as we were saying. It was a 6% increase for community colleges and about a 4% increase at, at, at public four years, for example. So, you know, that's a very promising sign. I mean, the, the number of, of new entering students has been sitting uh, for the last two years at about 10% below where they were in 2019 before the pandemic. So there's still a ways to go. We've got, a, we're, we're still 6% below where we were in 2019 in terms of the number of entering freshmen, mm. right? But a 4% increase from last year, that starts, that really does feel like uh, the start of a recovery if, if you're focused just on the entering class, those entering classes. Well, that's really good news. Um, that's much better news than, we, than we've had. Um, and just, uh, you're talking about undergrads. Uh, how is the graduate student population doing? Well, the graduate student population is actually declining and that's a reversal there. So very interesting, and to me, this really suggests that we're entering a kind of a new era. If you think of what, what the pandemic did, it devastated undergraduate enrollments, but it actually brought in a, an increase in graduate students. And that persisted for both of the first two years of the pandemic. And now in this second year, we're seeing that flip for graduate students for the first time, uh, a decline of about one and a half percent in the number of graduate students. So, so certainly for the four-year colleges in terms of their uh, sustainability and revenue, that the, the universities, that's a bad sign for them, um, but it doesn't affect the community colleges, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I, I've gotten into uh, fun arguments with uh, Josh Kim at Inside Higher Ed over this, where he, he argued that the, you know, that the master's level, PhD level, but especially the master's level is where there was a lot of growth. Mm -hmm. That seems to have been the case for a few years, but, but you know, that's, now it's paused. Right. Um, and that's very common in, in, you know, when we look at um, past recessions, for example, and, you know, many people are ready to forget that we we did have a recession at the beginning of the yep. pandemic as well yep. and um and the graduate student particularly those enrollments in master's programs and shorter shorter term uh graduate or post baccalaureate certificates even those programs all all bounced uh, went up for those first two years but they're starting to back off again now this is really, really good to know. And then I, I have one last question for myself, and then I'll open the floor, um, which is what the, you just changed the terminology of one classification um, of institutions that are primarily or mostly online. Um, and I think you folded that into a different category now. Right. We've combined that with, um, with what we call, <clears throat> sorry, what we call multi-state institutions. Mm -hmm. And... 
um, because we found that there, there, there's a large overlap between those two. And particularly when we were in, in this report, we were doing a lot, paying a lot more attention to state by state uh, analyses. And we realized that there are a handful of states out there who have or had uh, very large um, online institutions that were kind of distorting the picture for the state itself. In some cases, it was a very, you know, they were very small states in terms of their native students. New uh, these, these institutions were capturing students from all across the country. So we moved those out of the state analysis and put them into a separate kind of a state category of multi-state and primarily online institutions. We also, there, there's another there's another important uh, category that we changed in the institutional analysis though, and that is um, the addition of this, uh, or the separation out of this group of what we call primarily associate granting bachelor's institutions. So PABs. These are these are essentially all the former all the former community colleges who over the over the last decade or so, mostly in particular states, have um, become reclassified as four year institutions by the Department of Education because they've now gained the ability to award bachelor's degrees. Um, so so. Uh, they, they're four-year institutions in that sense, but they're still mostly community colleges in the sense that almost all of their students are seeking associate's degrees, and most of the, at least half of all the degrees that they're awarding are still associate degrees. And so they look a lot more like community colleges. And when we, we had put them in the four-year category, because that's what iPads calls them, right. um, but by by separating them out, we allow people to to kind of think of them differently, or if they want, they can combine them with the community colleges and come up with a more, more comprehensive look at just the community colleges. So that's been an interesting look at, and it's actually also a result of this ARC network that I was telling you about, the integrating mm-hmm. research in community colleges. One of the things that that group really felt was important was to be able to analyze those, those PABs primarily associate granting four-year institutions separately from the other sectors. So are the, I know a lot of community colleges are bulking up enrollment by doing dual enrollment with local high schools. Are these AB institutions also doing that? Yeah, they are definitely, okay. definitely. And, you know, some, some four-year institutions are doing that too, but their numbers are not nearly as large as they are for the, for the community colleges. Um, yeah, and then, uh, well, I, I, I'm going to keep, in t- I'm going to stop interrogating you because, because <laughs> you have more questions, um, and, and and thank you for uh, for all these uh, all these good answers. Um, we have uh, one uh, program question uh, that came up, um, and this is from uh, Angela Spring. Wants to know if this is going to be recorded for some that cannot attend. Yes, Angela, we record these. We post the recording to YouTube, and it'll be there on top of our playlist. Also, Angela, if you go to our uh, the forum website, we have a link to the entire archive in chronological order, plus a list of topics under that. Good question. Uh, and now we have a question that comes from uh, Philip Wallace, uh, who is an enrollment manager, who for whom en- enrollment is obviously front and center. And he asks, the first look fall 2022 in enrollment disaggregated total enrollment by major fields, HBCUs, HSIs, and POIs. Is there a way to get a breakdown for HBCUs and HSIs based on the CTEE? Now, I understand about 85% of that question. <laughs> yeah. There are black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, but I'm not sure what POI yeah. is or what the CTEE is. Yeah, so the CTEE is is just the abbreviation for the current term enrollment estimate. That's the report that I've just been talking about, the one that came out a month ago. And um, unfortunately, the answer is no. We so those categories we we did not include in the current enrollment report this time. Um, but we we will be bringing them back in the fall. Oh, very good. Very good. Um, thank you for the question, uh, by mm-hmm. the way, much appreciated. 
Um, and we have a, a question from our excellent friend, uh, Tom Hames, who is in uh, the, probably the last comfortable month in uh, Houston um, before the things warm up. And uh, Tom asks, what can you tell us about which groups are driving community college enrollment? And how much of that has shifted since pre-pandemic demographics? Oh, uh, great question. Yeah. So clearly um, we know that there's a lot of different groups here, but let me start with just ages. So older students have have um, been most affected by the declines. So if we just look at oh, under 24 and over 24 yeah. um, throughout the pandemic and including this this latest year, those older students, 24 and up, have been uh, falling at much greater rates than the younger students. And um, um, if you go even younger still to uh, current high school students or dual enrolled high school students, we, we count those as basically anyone under 18 at the time that they, that they start their enrollment. Um, those students have actually been increasing and in the last year quite dramatically like a oh. um, uh, i think a, a 12 percent jump 10 or 12 percent jump in the number of dual enrolled high school students at community almost all at community colleges um, in this year and in fact um that's that's been the the almost the only source of enrollment gains in community colleges this year. If you take them out, the community colleges uh, have actually declined. Um, wow. Yeah, so so that's a big, big factor is age. A another factor is um, race and ethnicity. And when we look at um, the art, well, there's been there's been a kind of a, a of a shift, a divergence here in terms of uh, the beginning of the pandemic, the first two years, and this and this last year, and in the first year, there, were, you know, um, black and brown students were were far and away the the largest uh, affected, the most affected well, community college students. So um, we saw some of the biggest declines among among black and Hispanic students and Native American students, um, and. In the, in the second and third years, though, um, we started to see uh, some of those, some of, oh, well, let me back up a minute. So when I say larger declines, the, they weren't too far apart. Most, you know, really the, that first year of the pandemic in the community colleges uh, affected almost everyone yeah, very possibly. similarly, but, but they were, but they were, but they, the declines were somewhat steeper for for minoritized students and white students didn't uh, fell a little bit less but in this in the, in the subsequent years we've seen increasing rates of losses among white students and uh and and much better results less declines for uh hispanic and asian students in particular oh. Oh. and um so those those two groups, in fact, are almost have almost. If you look at the entering freshmen, they've almost come come back to the to where they were uh, in 2019 before the pandemic. Asian and Hispanic students. Now, what's what's uh, unusual about that, or maybe expected, is that you know demogra demographically those those groups are ha are actually growing whereas white students have been declining if if you if you just look at the numbers of high school graduates so again for focused on freshmen and you look at the the projections that come from WICHE, the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Ed the knocking on college door reports mm -hmm. mm -hmm. those show pretty clearly that um uh, the number of white students are declining. The number of black students are about uh, flat, and the number of of Hispanic and Asian students are are increasing or growing. So, in some sense, if you if you factor in those demographic forces, um, you know, and think about well, well, black and Hispanic student, or sorry, Asian and Hispanic students should have been well above where they were in 2019 by now. Yeah. 
the fact that they're just getting back to 2019 levels means there's still important declines. But overall, you're, there's a much bigger uh, disparity between what happened in 2022 between black uh, and white students, which continued to decline in terms of freshmen at community colleges, and Hispanic and Asian students, which actually rebounded in 2022. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the, the, the enrollment may be roughly approximating the demographics where the white population declines, the black population is stable, Hispanic and Asian populations are growing, I mean, overall in general population. Exactly. And that's and that it also kind of feeds into my sense that, you know, we're we're kind of not really in the pandemic anymore. That that the, again, that pandemic uh, impact really hit all kinds of institutions uh, and all kinds of students uh, with almost equal force. Mm-hmm. But in the in the in in this latest year, that the, this divergence by different demographics is really stark, and it, and it suggests that the that the pandemic is receding as a as a driver of these changes, mm-hmm. and we're going back to some of the some of the big underlying forces like demographics, and economics, affordability, mm-hmm. and and um, um, yeah, yeah, that's. Well, as always, Tom, thank you for one of your typically deep, deep questions. And uh, Doug, thank you for that splendid answer uh, with so much detail. Thank you. Uh, friends, again, if you're new to the forum, those are examples of uh, questions from the Q&A box. Um, so please feel free to add yours. And if you want to join us on stage, click the raised hand button and uh, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, we have another question coming in uh, that focuses on this community college aspect. This is from uh, Amanda Burbage. It says, with community colleges drawing on K-12 through and with community colleges granting BA, BS degrees, will the distinctions between the higher education sectors, community college, four-year university, et cetera, begin to change? And uh, what might the benefits or drawbacks be? Uh, that's I, I think they will. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, it, as community colleges increasingly are able to grant bachelor's degrees, they will start to look more like four-year institutions. Um, the reverse is less likely, though. I don't think we're going to see uh, many uh, uh, four-year institutions um, awarding associate's degrees, although what What's really interesting to me is that many, in, when, when you look at the effects of the pandemic and the post-pandemic now, um, on four-year institutions, many of the, the less selective among them, the smaller colleges, the regional colleges, they're actually it, they actually experienced the pandemic in many ways uh, not much different from the way that community colleges did. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when you, when you, in fact, a fascinating shift, when I look at the shift, I was just talking about that divergence in the effect on different race uh, and ethnic groups among students, you can see a similar shift of a, a divergence um, in, in terms of enrollment effects on um, colleges and universities, particularly four-year colleges, in, in terms of selectivity. And when you, so when you look at that first year of the pandemic, like, and you, and you split up the four-year colleges by, just look at the Barron's uh, um, selectivity rating. So most competitive down to not competitive at all in terms of their admission selectivity almost straight lines across across those categories. They all lost about the same percent of students in the first year of the pandemic. The pandemic just did not differentiate, everyone suffered. But in the second and third years, so 21 and 22, we started to see a, 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 a huge divergence where the, the most selective, the elite colleges, the, the private, 
uh, um, elite privates and the, and the public flagships even uh, recovered very quickly in terms of their enrollments, even in, in 2021. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as you went down the selectivity uh, uh, scale, the declines just got steeper and steeper and steeper in 21. So just a, 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 almost a 45 degree angle. And in wow. 2022, that got even worse. Wow. So, so there's this huge split, like the, the, the elites, again, the most selective four-year colleges, they're, they're completely back to where they were and, and then some. Uh, they've got the kind of market power to, you know, attract as many students as they can possibly uh, want. And even in that first year of the pandemic, they were able, when their freshman classes declined, they were able to reach down into community colleges and, and attract more uh, transfer students to, to make up for some of that. Um, but, but all the rest, even from the kind of middle of the scale all the way down to the least selective, again, they, they just um, pr lost proportionately more students. And to the extent that those least selective four-year colleges, as I said, are suggested, are starting to look more and more like the primarily associate granting bachelor's degree uh, institutions and the community colleges themselves. So that kind of divergence is really stark. Wow, uh, that selectivity is is a is a really really strong driver. It sounds like um, fantastic question, um, Amanda. Thank you so much. And I, I, again, Doug, I, I admire just how much data you keep in your mind so clearly. Um, thank you. Uh, building building on this topic, we have a question from uh, uh, our good friend uh, Tony Sindelar, uh, who wants to know this. What about the missing students? What do we know about where they are going? Yeah, boy, I wish I knew. <laughs> I mean, I think the assumption is that most of them are out in the workforce. Um, you know, I, I think we 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 don't know it at the clearinghouse. We we only know who is in in college. Right. Um, but if you look at some of the some of the other sources like organizations that have actually surveyed students and and what what people are saying in the high schools and um and and what have you i think you know again in that first year of the pandemic we heard a lot of stories about students who were um uh staying at home caring for caring yeah. for children who were out of school uh or they were or they were working in in very low wage, often essential workers uh, uh, roles, trying to support their families financially through some very hard times. Yeah. In 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 2021 and 2022, we heard a lot about you know the the uh, uh, improving labor market, particularly for for uh, low skill, low wage workers. Wages were increasing last year. They continued to increase this year. And I think that was very, uh, looked very attractive, particularly for, for uh, new or recent high school graduates. There were a lot of fears about the costs of college, a lot of fears about taking on student debt. It was very much in the news when there were all these debates about, about um, uh, canceling student debt. And, and so I think I think that seemed like a good time for a lot of a lot of would-be college students to to sit out for a year or two and say, "I'm going to save up some money. I'm going to get one of these uh, uh, jobs that pay is paying pretty well right now." So the workforce, I think, is the main place that that the, the students are the the would-be students are or the missing students. But you know, some of those consider some of those uh, those. Um, drivers that I've just been describing seem to apply mostly to community college students um, who were willing to take, you know, the, uh, those um, uh, low, very low skill jobs that were that were in, in many senses booming uh, during the early part of the, of the last three years. But when we look at the when we look at the missing students, 
there's also been a huge shift from the beginning of the pandemic to 2022 in terms of what types of what types of programs we ex would have expected those students to be in. So when we look at the first year of the pandemic, for example, like 90% of the missing students would were from community came from community colleges. 90% of the missing students would have been seeking associate degrees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that over the next two years, proportionately more in each year of the missing students were actually four year, would be four year students. So that by 2022 in fall of 2022, we're completely flipped. 70, almost 75% of the missing students would have been seeking bachelor's degrees in 2022. Mm. Mm. So again, this huge change, huge shift, right? We're now looking at very different kinds of drivers of why students are not in college. And again, that doesn't tell us where they are instead, but that gives you a, a lot of a lot of clues about you know what kind of students they are, what they would have been doing in college and, and what they might what that means that they might be doing now in the workforce. So um, you know uh, again that shifting that uh, that shifting force and, and to me that also says these are these missing bachelor's seeking students are are probably you know moving the, further into say the middle class than you know the the that first year of the pandemic and and i think that says a lot about about again con economic concerns affordability concerns even middle income families are are feeling very worried about the cost of college and and uh, uh, very reluctant to borrow money. Not to mention this year, borrowing money more expensive is much more expensive. Goodness, the the interest rates on student loans this year a huge difference from where they were in 2019. Right, it's likely to keep uh, keep up. Um, Thank you, Doug, for a terrific answer. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for a really, really good question. Um, speaking of more questions, we have one that builds right on this, and this is from uh, Elizabeth Mihopoulos, um, who uh, asks this. Some reporting suggests dual enrolled students came from a demographic that did not traditionally enroll in post-secondary education. How might the increase in dual enrollment move the needle on traditional enrollment? Interesting. Um... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, because I, I normally think just the opposite, that that um, that most dual enrolled students are um, they're, they're, they're students who would not have traditionally enrolled in community colleges. So what's what's interesting is that they're they're taking classes in community colleges while they're in high school, but they're doing so in order to uh, to kind of accelerate their path to a four-year degree, oh, right? Oh. And most of them, after they graduate from high school, they're taking those credits not to the community college, they're taking those credits to a four-year college. And that is what we see in the data for the most part. Um, but but the, the public perception of dual enrollment, I think is different. I, and I think most people most people do kind of have this notion that dual enrollment is a, is a way to help uh, increase college access accessibility to students who might not otherwise uh, enroll in college or be thinking about college at all. And um, and I and there must be, you know, I, I think that is a real effect for some students, but not most in the, in the dual enrollment space. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the really, really good question. And uh, Doug, I really appreciate wrestling with it. Uh, the forum community, I'm so proud, uh, always ask such great, great questions. Uh, we have two uh, very detail oriented questions that are almost clarification questions. One comes from our good friend, uh, Charles Findlay, who asks, does your data include only domestic students or is there a breakout for international visa enrollments? Yeah, that's a good question and a hard one to answer. Um, up until this year, 
we did not include any international students in our current term enrollment reports. They are in our data, but not well represented. And so in the past, we've said, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's almost misleading to count them because we, so few colleges choose to report international students to the clearinghouse. Over the, over the years though, that, that has changed. And we, we decided this year that we now do have enough representation of international students that we have, uh, we have included them in the current term enrollment estimates. And so you see yeah. them, um, but um, you see them in the report, but um, you have to kind of treat those numbers with, with some caution because we don't actually have information on visas or, or, or step, uh, actual um, um, immigration status or anything like that. All we have is what the colleges report as part of the race and ethnicity codes. You know, the race and ethnicity codes are only supposed to apply to American students. And, right. and so, so they, they put in, uh, um, um, a, a code for international or non-resident, and that's what we use in this report. So you get some information there, but it's not it's not a hundred percent. Far from it. There's um, a new book uh, on this called uh, Classified. Um, uh, David Bernstein, which takes a look at the origins of American domestic racial classification systems in the 60s and 70s. Have you seen this yet? No, that sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah, it really does. I'm curious about that. But um, but thank you for that very honest, uh, candid answer. And uh, Charles, as always, you ask really, really good questions. We have uh, another question that um, uh, is, again, more of a, a kind of um, a very detailed question. This is from uh, Daniela Castro, who asks, are many colleges and universities considering offering degrees in Spanish? My previous college offered a certificate in associates 100% in Spanish. More than 80% of those students were older than 24 years. Wow. No, that's fascinating. I don't know, to be honest, but it, it's a great it's a, it's a great question, partly because of what we're, we were just saying about the growth yeah. in this population, of course. Um, I believe we don't even have that in a cut in our in our discipline codes someone else might know the answer to this i think this the uh, certainly what we use at the at the two digit cip code level for our our reports is um just gets you to foreign languages and literatures generally and i don't know mm -hmm. that they break out by specific languages well, that's a that's a fascinating idea. I mean, especially Daniela, since so you know so much of global higher education is moving towards English as language of instruction, it'd be fascinating to see uh, to see that change in the U.S. Uh, to more Spanish language classes. Uh, thank you, thank you. And maybe Doug, you know, maybe it's something to uh, to try out uh, for your next one. Um, we have uh, more questions coming in, and um, and we make sure everyone gets a chance to ask. And here's another one that goes back to my question about uh, primarily online or multi-state institutions. It's from Sergio Costa. Fully online institutions are reporting big increases in enrollment. Are, quote, we losing students or are they simply going to fewer competitors? Uh, I think it's a little of both. They've definitely, you know, those, those institutions have definitely been notching large increases uh, percentage-wise, but they're actually much you know they're 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 much smaller in terms of actual numbers than they were, uh, say, six years ago. Really? And um, yeah, the, 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 certainly the for profits um, that sector has shrunk a lot, and that's really? a lot. As I said, really? a lot of the online. Um, but but yes, the Western Governors and the Southern New Hampshire, they're they're much larger and they're still though attracting primarily um the older students there are very very few traditional age students in those institutions Ooh. and 
very, very few new freshmen, for example, first time students, almost mm -hmm. all. Um, uh, they have very high levels of transfer in students. So students, so what you're really losing, I would suggest to those institutions is not new students, not, not freshmen. You're losing students who stopped out probably at least five years ago. And um, if you're really focused on trying to uh, recover some of those stopped out students, and um, then, then yes, th those institutions are where you should go to learn how to attract them. <laughs> like they're doing what it takes to get students out of the out of the workforce who who might have a year or even two years of college under their belts, but never finished that degree, and to figure out a way to to entice them back with, um, you know with flexible programs that fit into the into adult lives, online convenience and um, and promises of uh, of relatively short paths to completion. They'll accept a lot of the credits, et cetera. So a lot of a lot of things that are that are um, really important to to um, serving the needs of older older students. And, you know, when we look at the possibly the continuing declines in the numbers of of traditional age freshmen demographically, um, yeah. you know, if 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 you want to get back to we saw like I said, we saw we still have a long way to go to get back to total enrollments of of uh, where we were in 2019. That's not that's not likely to happen um, just from new, income, you know, growing freshman classes alone. There aren't that many high school graduates that are going to be coming out in the next few years. Yeah. And um, um, uh, the, you know, and and transfer enrollments, as we, you know, we've been reporting as well in our transfer reports, have also been falling even more than than freshmen. So, you know, looking to transfer students to, to make up, to get back to where you were is, is not looking very promising either right now. Um, the, the, big, the big source uh, potentially is some college no credential students, which, um, uh, you know, we've been, we're now, we're now actually reporting an annual uh, uh, accounting of the some college no credential population. We'll have another report coming out in the next couple of months that quantifies how many of these students there are, what they look like demographically, um, how long it's been since they last enrolled, how many of them are returning in the last in each year. And um, um, we've had a, an awful lot of interest in that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, and Friends, we're, we're, we're somehow coming up towards the end of the hour, so I'm trying to get as many of the questions out as possible. Um, this is a, a great deep subject, and, and Doug is bringing an enormous amount of data to bear. So I just want to make sure that we get everything, uh, everything addressed. We, uh, we have a good question here from Greg Shuckman, who cuts the data in the, or cuts this topic in a different angle, which is really, really important. Um, what are you seeing with enrollment trends when you look at geography? Are the New England schools continuing to hemorrhage students while the schools in the South, South continue to grow, for example? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, well, hemorrhaging, you know, in certainly in the in the um, in the regions generally, the, the the largest declines have been in the some of the some of the New England states, but but the Northeast generally is not is not the worst off. I think the worst off is actually the Midwest right now. Yeah. But they're pretty close those two, <laughs> Northeast and the Midwest. And I think part of the problem about the about New England is the number of of not just the geography, but the the structure of the of the institutional. Um, uh, 
um, marketplace there. They have a lot of very small private colleges and, right. and many of them are, are the ones that are really suffering a lot. Whereas, you know, um, the larger publics are, are, are not doing much, much worse than other, other regions. How about, how's the West Coast doing? Um, the West Coast is very mixed. Um, um, we've seen declines in uh, California and Washington, um, um, but better results in, uh, you know, in some, actually, I'm not sure about Oregon. <laughs> um, but the West generally is certainly doing uh, better and the South is, is doing the best. And, and again, I think most of that is demographics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is driven, I think, by internal migration as well. Mm -hmm. um, good question. Thank you, Greg. Um, and again, Doug, thank you for that, uh, that tour. Uh, I was mapping <laughs> how you describe it state by state. One thing I might add there, just one one more point, when we look at transfer students in particular, we're seeing a, a, a large decline in, in um, uh, interstate transfers. So it used to be that there were a lot of students, say, from community colleges in one state who were, in, tra who were transferring into four-year institutions in another state. And, um, and that's, that's really fallen off quite a bit. Cool. So are, are transfers becoming more local, more in-state? Well, the transfers overall are are falling, and so you know some of those, some of the st the students who are transferring to other states tend to be going into those uh, uh, more selective elite institutions, and so they're uh, they've actually done okay. <laughs> um, but, but there are there are fewer overall um, because because those that sector is very small. The you know the the, the most selective elites. So understood. Understood. That's very interesting. Um, I, I think the the map you produced for this report was really really useful. Uh, I, I'd love mm -hmm. to see people uh, drill down on that. Uh, we have a question which which might take you to a little speculation. And I know you're careful about that, but I would just, just give us a try. Um, this is from John Henry Stites. Will the combination of declining college-age students and the need for massive retraining of the adult workforce due to digitization force a reckoning on public funding of post-secondary education? Wow. A lot to, uh, a lot to unpack there. I back on the screen there. <laughs> I, I'm. That's hard. I, I'm. I'd be hard pressed to 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 say that. I, I think it will certainly force a reckoning on the institutions themselves. I, I think schools really need to find ways to address the the um, the shifting needs of the population, meaning the declining uh, younger younger population that might be going to college and the growing numbers of older uh, learners that that need to be going to college. Um, whether that will lead to any kind of uh, shift in the in the call it the willingness of the public mm. to support those institutions or those students. Mm. Wow, I don't I don't even want to speculate on that one. I'm, 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 I would say I'm not optimistic though. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's a great speculative question, um, which I really appreciate. And, and Doug, I, I, I appreciate your very candid answer. Um, we, uh, we have a few more questions and I, I think we have time for at least a couple. This is from Shane Daly um, at uh, Pearson, I think. Uh, and Shane asks this, well, the missing students, has your organization looked into certificates or certification to see if the shift is in there? We don't have, well, outside of higher ed itself, we don't have data on, on certificates like, like um, uh, industry certificates and certifications. But 
certainly within higher ed, there are a lot of certificates that, have, that are awarded and we've seen a large shift there. In fact, some of the biggest areas of growth are in um, students who are, who are, we categorize them as other undergraduates. They're not seeking associates or bachelor's degrees, but they're generally, uh, well, some of those are the dual enrollment students, but th th most of them are students who are seeking certificates or other uh, short, shorter term uh, programs. And we've seen a big shift there. Uh, um, as we've seen generally in, in the students who are enrolled, kind of shifting away from longer programs and towards shorter term programs that offer lower cost and a quicker path to a better job. And I think that's that's pretty clear that what students are voting for with their feet is is those kinds of programs. Again, the, the, that strong presence of, of, of debt and cost. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, good, good question. And, and thank you, Doug. I think that would be some fun research for someone to pursue. Um, now we have a, a question after my own heart from Michael Meeks, Professor Meeks, and I want to just uh, put this up here. What is your intuitive opinion on enrollments five years and 10 years out? And who do you think will be the big winners and the big losers? Again, I know this is this is speculation, extrapolation. Right? <laughs> well, five and 10 years, that's a long way out. I, I think, um, you know, it will certainly be I, I think it's going to be institutions that can do what I was just saying, that can that can find ways to uh, repackage their offerings into shorter, smaller, more affordable and more digestible chunks of of credentials and skills mm. that am, that am, are in demand by employers. I think mm. that is uh, I think I think students are increasingly reluctant to uh, make the kind of long-term investments even in their own education mm. and we've seen in in gen in a generation um, uh, partly it's about it's about cost partly I think it's also just about the the um, increases in the level of anxiety about being you know, being able to earn a living wage, a middle class um, um, income, you know, as as the uh, as the income distribution has has um, uh, um, stretched, if you will. There's a wide, you know, the middle you, the middle class gets hollowed out. Yeah the the level of anxiety of of being left behind by that as the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer you want to make sure you're on that rich side and that's all about getting a good job fast before uh before it, it before it becomes out of reach and i think students really feel that particularly um, um younger students today in the, in the chat uh doug greg shuckman adds so the value proposition has changed um, the val in, in, explain what you mean by that, Greg. <laughs> I, th I think it means that the, the at least the perception of the value proposition of higher education has changed. That, uh, that you know, we 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 look uh, more expensive. I think uh, is 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 what is what he's adding. Um, well, I think students still feel that higher education is very valuable. I mean, that dual enrollment, that surge in dual enrollment for high school students, high school students really want college degrees. There's no question. They're not, they're not saying we don't think it's valuable anymore. They're saying we think it, it costs too much. And, and um, um, it needs to be, it needs to be much more instrumental. And we need to see that we need to see that return on investment very quickly. Interesting. Or, or we're not going to, or we're, you know, it's it's too risky otherwise. Mm. We've mm. seen too many. We've seen too many peers, other students, friends, relatives, who spent two years in college, piled up a lot of debt, and never earned a degree. And now where are they? That's very frightening to a lot of students. I think. That's. 
I, I hate to pause us on that note, Doug, but but that's that's a great uh, answer that helps us rethink a lot of where a lot of where we're headed. Uh, Professor Meeks, thank you for that for that great question. We are, I'm afraid, Doug, completely out of time. Um, the, this hour has just blazed past. Uh, you've been so generous with your thinking, with your research. I, I wanted to thank you, first of all, for being a fantastic guest again. And then second, what's the best way for everyone to keep up with you and the Clearinghouse's work? Well, uh, nscresearchcenter.org. We have all of our latest reports are posted there. And um, you can also sign up for alerts and blogs when our, when our new reports come out. Um, you, uh, uh, we, most of our reports, in fact, when you go to the website, uh, you will find interactive dashboards um, in Tableau that enable you to you know, really um, um, pick your own disaggregations and drill down wherever you wherever you think it's most important um, in our data, and uh, so I highly encourage you to check out the website. You'll also find there uh, um, downloads of the underlying data in a, in, in simple spreadsheets um, for all of our reports. So if you want to actually do your own calculations and recombine and do whatever you like, they're all there. <laughs> It's great stuff. I, I strongly recommend it. Doug, thank you for this great work. Please keep up the great work and give our best to the rest of the group at the Clearinghouse. We really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your time with me and all, all of your all all the all the discussions. Such terrific questions today. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care and be safe. But don't, don't leave yet, everybody. Uh, let me just point you out to uh, how we continue. And let me just second Doug's thanks for all these great questions. You all are awesome. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, uh, hit us up on Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. Here's my Mastodon link where you can find me or go to my blog, where actually I blogged about this in their most recent report. Uh, if you'd like to go back into our previous sessions or keep an eye out for our recording for this, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you want to look into the uh, previous topics, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us, click on forum topics, and you can see those there. Uh, if you'd like to uh, dig into this research even further, go to our FTTE report at FTTE.us and subscribe. And if you'd like to join us on Patreon, just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander. If you want to see our subjects coming up, just go to our forum site. And if you want to share your own exciting work, just email me and I'd be glad to share your work with our community. And in the meantime, thank you again for a terrific session. You all provided such great perceptive questions. I hope you're all doing well. And uh, as here in the Northern Hemisphere, summer or winter starts to give way to spring, I hope you're all safe and sound. Take care and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>